friends, Jay Todd here, back with our second edition of APCW Perspectives In Depth, where me and every week, uh, or sorry, every month, uh, somebody else in the gambling industry joins me and we kind of we kind of discuss some of the headlines. And uh, for the second time in a row, I'm going to be bringing in Mr. Gary Trask. There he is. How are you, sir? It's good to be here again, Jay Todd. And, you know, I love having you. I, uh, I know it's uh, a little bit of a midweek imposition, so I appreciate your time. That's kind of why I wanted to get different people so that no one has to pick up that burden every month because video is what I do and you guys do much more important things. Uh, you know, I, I had asked Anthony to do this with me, but Anthony uh, had uh, agreed. He's just very busy. He's getting a manicure today. And uh, later on, I think he's got an appointment at the spa. So yes. he'll be knocking those two out. I mean, I'm not judging. After this video, I got to shave my back hair. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not judging at all. So <laughs> we'll file that all under TMI. Too much info. <laughs> well, you know, um, I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to talk about the UK Gambling Commission and regulation a little bit, and just in general terms, because, because the UK GC has been the focus of so much ire and criticism over the past year, really, especially with the Gambling Act Review coming up. But I did want to mention that this show is being sponsored by APCW members, Alpha Affiliates. Valerie is over there. She's lovely. I've met her several times. Great girl. They've been in business since 2012. They got CPAs, rev shares, one of the lowest admin fees in the industry, resulting in the fact that your effective commission, if you work with them, comes out to over 40%. Uh, on the highest tier, of course. And they have a really interesting no negative carryover policy. So if you're not familiar with them, get over there and check them out on the APCW site or, or visit their website. You can do that and get there by going through APCW. So the UKGC, recently they fined a land-based casino over there, 600,000 pounds. And they uh, recently suspended the license of BGO for, let me see, failing to protect consumers. That's all they said. But we don't know what the hell happened. All we know is BGO got their license yanked and the UK GC got 600,000 pounds plus richer. Again, we don't really know where any of this money goes. I mean, have you ever seen a report, uh, a, a, any kind of transparency on where all these millions and millions of pounds and fines end up? No, and it, it's a great question, and and you know I often you know find myself asking the same question when when you talk about these sports leagues when they you know the NFL finds a guy for throwing a football into the stands or or doing a dance after a touchdown. I mean, where do all those fines go? So um, I don't think the UKGC is alone in not uh, explaining where the fines go, uh, but but they have piled up some some real exorbitant um, fines over the years, and that's a lot of money. And um, I would you would hope that there's some sort of requirement that that it has to go to problem gambling or to certain uh causes um that are gambling related because like i said it's 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 a it's a heap of money that they've they've created um on fines over the years that is true and you know um i say all that to get to the point that they the football index collapsed i think back in march april may sometime around in there and while they're issuing these fines and taking licenses from people, they are simultaneously issuing statements that say they're not at fault for the collapse of the football index. They're, they're just the regulator. And uh, that it wasn't a Ponzi scheme. I think it's, it's funny that they worked that into their response. And just so they, they issue all these fines, they take licenses. And then when it comes to something that's a sticky wicket, they absolve themselves. I mean, what the hell's up with that? Yeah, I think the football index situation um, really, I mean, there were red flags. There's been red flags with the UKGC for years, but the football index uh, situation was something that I think opened a lot of eyes because they, number one, they were late to the party. Um, they didn't realize um, what kind of betting product it was. And they didn't, you know, they claimed that they didn't know the complexity of the novel betting product. Um, that's their job. Um, and, you know, I know most people, when they don't do their job, they either get fired or they get fined. And the UKGC is fine with uh, handing out fines. So that's their job. And they were late to the party on that. And then they awarded them the wrong, they awarded them the wrong type of license. 
uh, as it came out per report. So that was, I think that opened a lot of eyes. I think people, even, even in the industry, like myself, you, you hear the UKGC people complaining about the regulator and, you know, that's, that's a common thing. People complain about regulators in our business and it happens a lot, but when you, when you, when something like this happens and people lose money and their account just evaporates because the UKGC was late to the party and awarded the wrong kind of license, then it's like, whoa, people are losing money here. But consumers that, that with trust and confidence um, deposited money and were winning money and then saw their accounts just evaporate. So I think the football index um, situation is something that uh, it's going to cause a lot of problems here in the long run for the UKGC. I agree. And as you were speaking, I couldn't help but notice a sort of parallel to the way people were feeling after Black Friday. Uh, there was thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars in these accounts. And of course, in that situation, it was, it was different. The government actually stepped in and grabbed it all. But the end result was the same, that players had lost all their money. And there was really some confusion about recourse and how they were going to reclaim that. With the football index, when you have an organization like the UKGC dropping the ball, and it's pretty much an internal thing with the football index, kind of, sort of, the same way Full Tilt's Ponzi scheme collapsed, right? Uh, and the in this situation, the UKGC says, not our fault. So there's a serious question about whether or not these players will actually get their funds back. Yeah. And, and if they do, it'll, it'll be years because the people that lost money in full tent, full tilt, I think most of them got their money back, but it was years in the making. And you have to go through a lot of red tape um, to, to get it back. So it, it the football index, it, it kind of goes back to a point that 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 that, um, that I've been thinking about when I look at who's running the UKGC. And the, now the UKGC, they didn't start looking into the football index situation till early 2020. And it was a report that said they only started investigating it because they got a complaint from an unnamed person, quote, with extensive experience in the gambling sector. So this was brought to the attention to the commission from somebody with experience in gambling. And they told them that it was an exceptionally dangerous pyramid scheme and quote, a disaster waiting to happen. So that, that's the only reason why they decided to jump in and, and investigate it. And as you and I were talking before the show, if you look at who's running the UKGC, so right now, Andrew Rhodes joined as the um, interim uh, commissioner of, of the UKJC. He comes to the commission from Swansea University, where he was registrar and chief operating officer. Prior to his role in higher education, he held senior roles at a range of organizations, including Department for Work and Pensions, Food Standards Agency, and the DVLA. He has no experience in gambling and he's running a gambling commission. If you look at Neil MacArthur, who uh, was with the UKGC for 14 years, he was the CEO for three years. He's a lawyer. His previous experience, I don't believe, according to his LinkedIn page and from what, I, from what I've read his bios, he does not have experience with gambling. So the, we have people running a gambling commission that are not familiar with gambling. And as you and I know from being in the industry, when you talk to people that don't know gambling, you can tell right away that they don't know gambling. If you like, if I tried to talk about um, knitting, you would know right away, I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. And I would never run an organization that ran um, people who knit. <laughs> I guess that was a bad example, but you know, you, know my, you know my point. You can tell right away when someone doesn't know gambling when you talk to them. And, and I think that's a problem. I think you need people with experience in the gambling industry. And there's plenty of them out there Maybe they wouldn't want to uh, run the UKGC because they, number one, wouldn't want to deal with all the, all the red tape. And number two, um, they probably take a pay cut. Um, but I think you need people that know gambling to be running the gambling commission. I think that's, that's the larger problem here. Well, you know, I, I think that's an unfair statement, Gary. I'll tell you why. The guy that makes donuts down at the grocery store near my house he fixed the transmission in my car like that. I mean, he was amazing. So, so I guess we don't always need an expert to be doing the expert things. I, I'm, I'm dying here. Bail me out. <laughs> <laughs> no, some people are multi-talented, but um, I don't think I'd want that guy running the UKGC. Well, it's kind of like what I, 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 in the last video I did, I said that, uh, you know, just because you were unaware, as the Gambling Commission's 
saying, they're trying to hide behind that, saying it's not our fault because we weren't aware. It was similar to, you know, when you have a salmonella outbreak up there, you know, uh, anywhere. It, you, you serve bad chicken and 15 people go to the hospital with salmonella and 20 more in their bathroom, popping emodiums, begging for their life to God. It, no one's going to care that you didn't know the chicken was bad. It's still your responsibility. It happened on your watch. So I think it's a very weak excuse that the UKGC is used. We're going to talk more about them. We're going to take a break real quick. We're going to, we're going to come back. We're going to talk more about the UKGC and the internationalization of regulation, which the UKGC is interested in. And since they've done such a stellar job in the UK, why not expand internationally? It's not exactly what they're talking about, but the point is valid. We'll be right back. Hey friends, welcome back. Uh, I'm here with Gary Trask from Casino City. Gary is responsible for all the quality or lack thereof with the videos. So thank you for that, Gary. Uh, it, it, <laughs> you've done a stellar job. I know you're having to work with me, so your hands are somewhat tied. Uh, you didn't know I was gonna be this way, so it's not your fault, right? I was warned, I was warned. Well, there you go. By, by unnamed people, but I was I was definitely warned. I remember Ben. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, we were talking before the break about the internationalization of of uh, regulation, and the UKGC has some concerns about it, and I do too, from a little bit different perspective. Uh, they're concerned that, number one, if operators are operating in multiple jurisdictions, they're generating a lot of money in these other jurisdictions and in the one that the regulators watching them in. So if something goes wrong, they have all these other funds to pull from. Maybe an operator gets a little fast and loose with the rules, knowing that you know the regulator can't hurt them that bad. Or, or maybe they have enough funds to challenge the regulator legally. Um, there was also the concern from them about uh, the multicultural aspects of cooperation between regulators in that what may be fine in Russia may not be fine in Sweden and may be iffy in the UK. So working together could be an issue. And that kind of leads into a little bit about what I was concerned about with uh, the cooperation between jurisdictions. We've already seen Malta working with the Dutch and the Dutch working with the Swedes. And uh, if something happens, say in one jurisdiction and you get a fine as an operator, if they actually work together across borders and maybe it's something you didn't understand or you, you didn't know, so it's not your fault. And you decide maybe I can't work in this market anymore. So you withdraw, which has happened. Uh, then who's to say that regulator can't still fine you for something? And, and if you get a fine there and say, well, we disagree, we're not gonna pay it, it's exorbitant or what have you. If there's cooperation, that could affect your operations in other jurisdictions. Another operator, say it's it's in Sweden and the, the, the Dutch issue a fine and they withdraw, Sweden be like, don't worry, boys, we got your back. You can't work in this jurisdiction either until you take care of your obligations in that jurisdiction. So I don't know if this is something that is a realistic concern for affiliates because affiliates do work with, with gray markets sometimes. They're still profitable. So, uh, I mean, do you remember a few years ago about the UKGC fining a, uh, a parent company of some UK casinos that, that had, their casinos have been licensed in the UK mm -hmm. and those casinos didn't really do anything wrong. But the UKGC fined that company because there was, uh, 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 they also operated a casino that was operating in a gray area. 
And so they were fining the, the head of the company because of what one did and it affected their operations with the other casinos. Do you recall that at all? I do a little bit. Yeah. And, it, and it's a, it's definitely, these are the type of things that are, are definitely a concern for, for affiliates. Um, in the GPWA magazine, we all, we always do affiliate interviews. And uh, one of the things we always ask is, you know, what, what do you wish you knew now uh, that you didn't know when you started? And, and also we ask, ask a lot of the affiliates, uh, what would they, what advice would they give to anyone starting out in the affiliate business? And, and one of the common answers is, is the regulation is just so confusing and convoluted it's something that you really have to uh, pay attention to because because it could come obviously it could cost you if you're not following those regulations. And um, you mentioned the different jurisdictions and the different rules. It's similar to what's going on over here in the U.S., where all the states, you know, the sports betting is exploding, but there's not one federal law or regulation. Each state is almost like its own country. And so, if you're in different states, um, you have to be aware of the different different regulations and the different um, things that you could be fined for. So. Uh, going back to your concern for affiliates, it's, it's definitely a concern. And, and if, you're, if that's something that you're not um, uh, up on, you, you need to find the help or, or know what you're getting into before you, you go into a jurisdiction because um, it could end up costing you. You know, uh, I'm not one to plug my other gig, but a few years ago, uh, while working on a, uh, an interview for This Week in Gambling, I actually spoke to a representative from the American Gaming Association about what they call a federal regime, a federal framework. They were not in favor of federal regulation per se, but I believe the terminology she used was a federal uh, oversight that sets a minimum standard that all states have to meet. And what they go beyond that or the particulars would still be up to them, but a, a minimum standard of regulation from a federal perspective. And I, I'll put a link to that up above this in the YouTube video. And uh, if, it's, if you don't see it, I'll leave a link to it down below this as well, if, if you're interested in that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, you know, as an affiliate, when I, when I got out of the industry back in, well, quit doing so much affiliate work back in 2006 because of the threat of prison from Washington State, um, UIGEA followed shortly after and would have, you know, decimated a lot of what I had built anyway. But, uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of concerns per se about uh, working with regulators as an affiliate. It was still a little bit of that Wild West. And I think it's odd that when the UIGEA hit, what affiliates really wanted more than anything was regulation. We thought regulation would solve our issues because we had seen what, what had happened in the UK, that affiliates were still good to go over there. But back then the UKGC wasn't quite as aggressive. You think it's a political thing? You think it's a money grab? I mean, there's a lot of fundamental changes. Is it just when something grows this big and there's that much money in it, you're just inevitably going to draw the attention of government. As you often point out in your videos, Jay Todd, follow the money. And usually when there's a lot of money at stake, um, the money rules and, and politics get involved. And, and, and that's, um, that's unfortunate, but it's the way the world turns. And it's been like that for a long time. I, I don't know if it'll ever change. Um, but I do remember that interview you did with the woman from the AGA. And I think that's a great idea to have some sort of minimum bar where um, every state had to get to some sort of um, even playing field, be, you know, where they went on beyond that um, would be decided at a later time. Um, that would be difficult to do, obviously, over in Europe, because they're, they're literally different countries. Um, so I don't know if you think that there's something that, the, that if, there, if that could happen over in Europe, but it sounds doubtful. So again, it goes back to the affiliates having to be really careful in knowing uh, the different jurisdictions and, and the different rules and regulations in each one. It can get confusing. That's true. And, and to your point, just to wrap up, I've, uh, I, I believe that the, the way the state by state thing has gone over here is, is fairly similar to the country by country thing within the European Union. And I know that some people may not uh, want to, to compare the US with its states to the EU with its countries, but it is uh, logistically speaking, uh, quite similar. So always interesting 
always interesting. Uh, I hope that when affiliates watch this, maybe it spurs up some questions and they can throw them out at us. And maybe we're going to address them on a, uh, a future edition of APCW Perspectives in Depth. <laughs>